Welcome. This is the um, fourth class in an ongoing series that I've named Anthro is Fun. Anthropology is the study of humanity, biologically, culturally, through time, for um, every place on earth. Uh, there is absolutely nothing that human beings or our closest relatives, uh, including uh, the various apes and monkeys and so on, uh, that you know that humans and our cousins can do that is not fun it's not part of the amazing science of anthropology so this is part four of the ongoing series where we make the segue into cultural anthropology cultural and social so we're looking at culture and and in later parts of this we're going to be looking at um, specific subjects because the you know the subject of human culture is so enormous what i've done is i've broken it up into smaller segments so this is part 4a and then there's going to be i think b and c possibly d um don't exactly remember anyway my um my mainline business is I am a healer. I'm a healer of bodies, minds, and souls. I've got a variety of techniques, two different master's degrees, one in anthropology and the other one in psychology. I am a certified and registered clinical hypnotherapist, um, very prestigious um, study institute. I was supervised for a year before I was allowed to go out and start treating people on my own. I'm also a certified life coach. And again, this was a, a one year program with then um, an internship and supervision and stuff. So um, you can imagine that I'm pretty good at that too. I am also a Reiki healer. Uh, Reiki master, both traditional Yasui, the Holy Fire Yasui, and Karuna Reiki. Uh, Reiki is absolutely not woo woo. Um, it's it's done in hospitals and and so forth. Um, very well studied for uh, pain and anxiety reduction, and it's also pretty darn good. Although you know only at this point anecdotally so for a heck of a lot of other things. So what I do is I look at the most important problems that people have, and I have put together programs that address those particular problems. Go to my website, um, explore, I do events, I do um, special weekend um, fun things in lovely Ashland, Oregon, and, and I also the author of several books that are all related to wellness and health and um, getting our heads uh, screwed on correctly. So without further uh, flummery, um, Anthro is Fun, part four. Um, A, part four A. All right, so here we've got an outline of what the entire Anthro is Fun, part four is going to be about, right? So we're going to define, we're going to look at living cultures and extinct cultures, the various ways that cultural anthropologists study them. It's like, how do we know what's going on with these various cultures? Do you just barge in there and, and say, oh, hi, so uh, what are you doing there? Um, no. <laughs> and then I'm going to, um, in this class, I'm going to look at economic subsistence, how people get food, how they make a living in all the various ways that human beings do that. And the ways that um, the amount of power you have in society, um, it's not, um, in, in every culture, power and um, economics are not um they're not a hundred percent in alignment okay in american culture the more money you've got the more stuff you can buy and the less you worry about where your next meal is coming from and and so forth um not necessarily in every culture um we've also got the categories of you know how our power is shared 
we've got um, bands and tribes and chiefdoms and states. We've got categories of, of this economic organization. How do people make a living? They forage, they do horticulture, which is like gardening, not very intensive. Uh, agriculture, which is intensive. Ranching, animals, right? Raiding, which is stealing <laughs> by any, another name. Uh, and then in the, in the industrialized, really intensive fertilizer, blah, 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 agriculture that we're familiar with here, okay? Um, you could be assured that there are no political discussions going on. This is, this is a serious uh, class. So, okay, what is culture? Okay, culture has a, as many different definitions as there are human beings on earth, which is at the moment, I think it's 9 billion. So, <laughs> slight exaggeration. Anyway, culture is how we behave the the habitual ways that we behave. Um, in a modern American culture, we don't walk out the door without clothes on, or at least a bathrobe. Um, we, we wear shoes. Um, we use forks and spoons. You, when it's somebody's, the anniversary of somebody's, the day that they were born, um, you have a big party, you eat cake, you bring a present. Uh, you don't go visit somebody without you know, bringing a gift. Um, these are all cultural elements. Um, there, there, and that's just, you know, a, a scattering of, of, of thoughts on the subject. So when you're studying culture and one of the cultures that you can study as an anthropologist is arguably your own. I've read, um, ethnographies, which are cultural anthropological studies of what goes on in a cocktail lounge, what goes on in a bar, right? There's a power structure, the bartender versus the waitresses, how people talk, how people behave, what's allowed, what's not allowed, customer behavior, what's allowed, what's not allowed, what you're allowed to, you know, good behavior, marginal behavior, and then the behavior that gets you thrown out. Um, just so many nuances. And when you, um, as a human being, you can walk into a place that you've never been. I could walk into a sports stadium, for example. I have no idea what the cultural rules are, you know. Um, and I might, I might, you know, what, what you do when you're walking into a new situation is um, you lurk. And that's a term that got started um, in the online world. You're, instead of just, you know, barging into a, a, uh, an online discussion group and, you know, blasting away, you, you, you listen. You look at what are the cultural rules. And when I was teaching um, regular undergraduate classes, I would have my students go someplace that they've never been before and try to infer the cultural rules by watching people. Now, this way of doing things simply by watching is different from, I go to a sports stadium, I sit down, I watch, and then I start asking the people around me, oh, is it okay for me to jump up and down and scream or should I sit here quietly, right? It, I, I can ask people, what are the cultural rules? We'll get to that. For now, I want to talk about the absolutely critical subject of cultural relativism. If you go to the American Anthropological Association website, um, you'll find some, some excellent materials on this. We, we call it the prime directive, a bit of a Star Trek joke there. You don't, when, when you're, when you're um, studying another culture, you have to start with the idea that this is a, a culture that has um, a validity all its own. And whatever they're doing, this culture is not a failed attempt to be the culture that I grew up with. In other words, the culture that I grew up with is not normal and everybody else is an aberration, right? It's particularly difficult for people in modern Western culture 
to not get into this mindset because after all we've got iPods and iPads and you know and all these cool things obviously we're superior to somebody who is living in a horticulture village and raising pigs right no actually we're not making value judgments about one culture versus another what we're doing is we're walking into the process of studying another culture with a clear mind a blank slate ask questions stop comparing and remember that cultural relativism which means I walk into a situation with the assumption that every culture has value and I'm here to learn not to make value judgments okay that's not the same as moral relativism that doesn't mean anything goes because we do have some things that are generally worldwide uh, agreed upon um, that are morally wrong um, genocide is always wrong slavery is always wrong um, there are some other the um, you know gross exploitation um, of, of a particular gender um, uh, a particular ethnic group you know um, um, you know murdering your children you know? <laughs> um, so um, you know, we, we, we're, not, we're not talking about moral relativism. There are some um, generally agreed upon no-nos. Um, but um, cultural relativism is very, very important. It's difficult. It's the sort of thing that an anthropologist has to take a deep breath and come back to center over and over and over again to avoid this natural human tendency of comparing everything to, you know, how I was raised, which is, you know, obviously superior to everybody else. Okay, now remember when you're studying culture, if people know that they're being watched, that is going to affect them because there is a universal human desire to look good, right? If you know you're being watched in American culture, you don't pick your nose or scratch your butt. Um, and there's so many other things you don't um, you don't talk about. One of the problems that every culture has is these things that we do that we don't talk about: domestic abuse, elder abuse, um, racism that we don't want to you know own up to. So. Um, and in and when, so when people know that they're being observed until they stop noticing that you're there they are going to be affected by you know being on their best behavior right so can this be overcome not entirely uh, there are ways of of helping it along so if you are just observing merely observing you're not asking questions so I'm gonna to go to the sports stadium and I am going to watch what's going on and try to figure out the rules of the game just by watching and I'm gonna uh, observe the behavior of the people around me and I'm gonna act like them you know you know make a wave when everybody's making a wave and scream when everybody screams um, and you know be quiet the rest of the time etc I actually had an experience uh, an accidental experience in cultural anthropology. Approximately 20 years ago, I was um, stuck in a uh, hotel for, I was having a very relaxing weekend in uh, Rotorua, uh, New Zealand. And there were only two channels. One was a, um, a cultural documentary on Polynesian culture, which you know ran for two hours and then looped. So after two hours, I needed the other channel because uh, I had walked for about seven and a half hours and I was exhausted. I just wanted to chill out um, for that evening. And um, 
the other channel was running um, a cricket test. Now, I'm a college professor, okay? I know what the word test means <laughs> in my culture. And these people were, were tossing balls around. So clearly the word test meant something in cricket that I was not aware of. Also, I had no idea how the game was being played. I had no idea you know, about any of the rules. And I sat there for three hours um, scribbling notes, trying to figure out uh, how cricket works and what the verbiage means and you know and what the rules were and how you made points and um, it, you know it's the sort of thing that you know you might have been exasperated but I turned it into a cultural anthropology uh, experience <laughs> and I kept myself entertained anyway so that is what a cultural anthropologist would do when they're simply observing now it's hard to observe um, and and have you know the the observing unknown thing there. Um, you can do that to some extent with non-human animals. It's hard to do with humans unless you teleport yourself to the 23rd century and you've got the Star Trek technology of you know four screens and so the people can't see that you're watching them. Um, Anyway, you now now you understand what the drawbacks and the advantages are, right? The advantage is you're you're looking at the behavior without being prejudiced by what people are telling them, telling you about it, right? It's like, oh, that looks horrible, um, and they're saying, oh no no, you know, um, um, sacrificing our children to you know the water god is really a good thing. Um, that's a fairly ridiculous example, but. Um, the participant observer option is more common these days. In this situation, you um, you come to this culture, you come to this um, you know town, village, whatever, um, and you say, "Hi, I'm Victoria Leo. I'm an anthropologist from Southern Oregon University, or whatever. Um, I have uh, I would like to get to know." your culture better, I want to understand you, and I'm going to publish my results so that everybody on earth can understand you better. Um, and of course, I will share all the results with you. Um, I would like to participate in the life of the village. I would like to you know, raise pigs and the weed, um, the yam fields, and um, uh, cultivate rice and make beer and, you know, um, diaper babies and the whole nine yards. Whatever you're doing, I'll, I'll, I'll join you and, and do it. Um, as long as I can, you know, do that without being annoying. Um, and, and I'd like to be able to ask questions. Uh, thank you so much. Most people are um, perfectly um, happy to explain, you know, this is, this is why we cover our heads in church. This is why um, we wear the clothing that we wear on Easter. This is why we, we do this and we don't do that, right? This is why, you know, we don't drink alcohol, um, you know, whatever. Um, now, one of the things that, I mean, I know this sounds like a police interrogation, the informants, but cultural anthropologists also refer to the people who answer their questions as informants. Now. There is a certain amount of bias going on here. Um, the people who are most willing to answer questions are people who have an agenda. So the people at the top of the hierarchy um, are generally too busy enjoying their elite status to want to waste time answering your questions, unless um, they want to sick their PR person on you. <laughs> and the, the, the people in, in all cultures, again, of course, want to look good. So, you know, the elite in whatever society it is will have somebody who wants to tell you how, um, how wonderful the, the, the culture is and, um, and how everything is, is really quite fair. Um, you know, there aren't, there isn't, um, nobody's being exploited or you know, blah, blah, blah. So there's, there's that 
bias, right? The other people who are most happy to talk to you tend to be the people who are on the outskirts of the society. Um, they tend to be the outliers, the folks who um, um, are not um, typical. Um, so, you know, you have to be careful of that bias. Uh, try to get as broad a cross section of the people that you're studying to talk to you. Now, um, there, there are um, power um, differentials in some societies. It's dangerous for some people to talk to you. Um, when and there are, there are some built-in biases. You've got. If you've got outsiders studying indigenous people, they've got this cultural relativism problem to deal with. You know, there's always the danger of somebody um, who forgets that iPods and iPads are not, don't make you a superior human, human being, um, will, will not value what they're seeing, okay? And then you'll also say, uh, you'll have the insight, if, if, a, if a study is done by an insider, for example, I've got a good friend, Japanese American, um, who studied a Japanese American community, and she had to pull, she chose to pull her punches. Now, she was not, she was a historian, not a cultural anthropologist, so she didn't have as much of an ethical uh, challenge there, but she deliberately did not report on issues of involving um, domestic abuse of women and so forth and so on because she was a member of that ethnic group and there would have been retribution and her career could have been stalled, stymied, you know, et cetera. And she chose um, to be a realist and, um, you know, um, but that's not the way to do good science, right? So, um, you know, there isn't a superiority of insiders versus outsiders. There's, there's dangers either way. The best cultural anthropological teams have some insiders, some cultural anthropologists who are members of that culture or who are very familiar with that culture and some who are, who have fresh, clear eyes, um, and are free from the dangers of retribution. Max Weber, bless his heart, um, 20th century said, there are three different ways to, to stratify, right? We're very familiar with wealth, power, and prestige. In mainstream American culture, those three things are very much in alignment with each other. If you've got wealth, you've got power, and you've got prestige. In some cultures, you can have wealth, but not prestige, power, but not prestige, you know, et cetera. Um, in some cultures, wealthy people don't have power. Power is uh, aligned with birth, with lineage. Um, so, we've got, we can look at, when we study cultures, we can look at economic stratification, political stratification, political remember means power, who's got power and who doesn't, and then prestige, which is social status. Um, I live here in the Pacific Northwest, the native people here gained prestige by giving away wealth. Uh, it's, it was called a potlatch. And it was a way of redistributing the, um, the material goods. You know, somebody had a lot of salmon and somebody else, you know, had a, had a poor fishing season. Um, the person who has a lot shares with everybody. Everybody goes, ooh, isn't he generous? Um, and you get a lot of social prestige, a lot of respect because you are generous rather than a lot of respect because you hoard everything and keep all your wealth to yourself. So, um, so in some cultures that this is, you know, these three things are orthogonal to each other. In some cultures, one or more of them are aligned with each other, so. All right, now let's look at linkages. 
these things do not exist in a vacuum, right? People generally will gravitate um, socially evolve into a governing structure that fits their subsistence. One of the points that I'm going to make throughout this entire Anthro is fun class four and class five um, and possibly class six too, is that um, if you look at the physical environment, is the soil, is it, do you have good soil? Is it, is it um, well, do you have a lot of rain or is it scrubby grassland or is it mountainous or is it by the seashore or is it whatever, right? If you look at the physical environment, you can predict what kind of subsistence, how people are going to get their, get their food, how they're going to get fed, um, which allows you to predict what the population levels are going to be, and it allows you to predict what kind of governing structure. How is power going to be distributed? Is this going to be an egalitarian, everybody's got about as much power, or is this going to be a, um, a very um, unequal culture? Okay. Um, one of the things that I recommend is that you make a chart so that you can link um, environment, subsistence, power, and other things and see how they're related. Okay. So one of the things that we can look at is your, your um, organization, how we organize power. And we can also look at subsistence, how subsistence is organized. And that is the subject of the next class, which is going to be available to you. And it's called Anthro is Fun, Part 4B. Looking forward to seeing you then. Come visit me at www.soaringdragon.biz, B-I-Z, Email me at victoria.leo.reiki, R-E-I-K-I, at gmail.com. Talk to you soon.